and welcome back to story time. Uh, so this is our all ages story time and uh, this is part two of Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne, which is much, much shorter than the first Jules Verne book that we read. Jules Verne in brief, I guess you could say. And my goodness, these chapters are a lot smaller than those um, previously we had read, uh, what was it? 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which definitely shows his knowledge of um, all things sea and, uh, you know, aquatic life and stuff like that, which actually, um, I thought that it was just something that he had researched, but he was actually born of a seafaring family. And so I guess he took that knowledge and all of those sensibilities with him and wrote the book of um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But this one uh, shows more about, you know, his knowledge of traveling around the world and uh, all of that stuff. So it'll be interesting to see his take on different cultures of the time. Anyways, go ahead and get started. Chapter 12, in which Phileas Fogg and his companions venture across the Indian forests and what ensued. In order to shorten the journey, the guide passed to the left of the line where the railway was still in progress of being uh, in the process of being built. This line, owing to the capricious turnings of the Vinda, uh, Vindia mountains, did not pursue a straight course. The Parsi, who was quite familiar with the roads and paths in the district, declared that they would gain twenty miles by striking directly through the forest. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cormarty plunged to the neck in the peculiar howdahs provided for them, were horribly jostled by the swift trotting of the elephant, spurred on as he was by the skillful Parsi. But he endured the di they endured the discomfort with true British phlegm, taking little and scarcely able, uh, talking little, and scarcely able to catch a glimpse of each other. As for Passepartout, who was mounted on the beast's back and received the direct force of each concussion as till he trod along, was very careful, in accordance to his master's advice, to keep his tongue from between his teeth, as it would otherwise have been bitten off short. The worthy fellow bounced from the elephant's neck to his rump and vaulted like a clown on a springboard, yet he laughed in the midst of his bouncing, and from time to time took a piece of sugar out of his pocket and inserted it in uh, Keuni's trunk, uh, who received it without uh, in the least slackening his regular trot. After two hours, the guide stopped the elephant and gave him an hour for rest, during which Keuni, after quenching his thirst at a neighboring spring, set to devouring the branches and shrubs round about him. Neither for Sir Francis nor Fogg regretted the delay, and both descended with a feeling of re relief. "'Why, he's made of iron!' exclaimed the general, gazing admiringly at Keuni. "'Of forged iron,' replied Passepartout, as he set about re preparing a hasty breakfast." At noon, the Parsi gave the signal of departure. The country soon presented a very savage aspect. Copses of dates and dwarf plums, uh, palms succeeded the dense forest. Then vast, dry plains dotted with scanty shrubs and sown with great blocks of cyanite. All his, this portion of uh, Bundelkund which is little frequented by travelers, is inhabited by a fanatical population hardened in the most horrible practices of the Hindu faith. The English have not been able to secure complete dominion over this territory, which is subjected to the influence of rajas, whom it is almost impossible to reach in their inaccessible mountain fastness. The travelers several times saw bands of ferocious Indians who, when they perceived the elephant striding across the country, made angry and threatening motions. The Parsi avoided them as much as possible. Few animals were observed on the route. Even the monkeys hurried from their path with contortions and grimaces which convulsed Passepartout with laughter. In the midst of his gaiety, however, one thought troubled the worthy servant. What would Mr. Fogg do with the elephant when he got to 
Allahabad. Would he carry him on? Uh, would he carry him on with him? Impossible. The cost of transporting him would make him rain, um, ruinously expensive. Would he sell him or set him free? The estimable beast certainly deserve some consideration. Should Mr. Fogg choose to make him, Passepartout, a present of Kiuni, he would be very much embarrassed, and these thoughts did not cease worrying him for a long time. The principal chain of the Vindias was crossed by eight in the evening, and another halt was made on the northern slope in a ruined bungalow. They had gone nearly twenty-five miles that day, and an equal distance still separated them from the station of Allahabad. The night was cold. The Parsee lit a fire in the bungalow with a few dry branches, and the warmth was very grateful. The pro- uh, <clears throat> sorry. The provision- oh, goodness, I cannot say this word. The provisions purchased at Colby sufficed for supper, and the travelers ate ravenously. The conversation, beginning with a few disconnected phrases, soon gave place to loud and ready, uh, steady snores. The guide watched Kiuni, who slept standing, bolst uh, bolstering himself against the trunk of a large tree. Nothing occurred during the night to disturb the slumberers, though occasional growls from panthers and chatterings of monkeys broke the silence. The more formidable beasts made no cries or hostile demonstrations against the occupants of the bungalow. Sir Francis slept heavily, like an honest soldier overcome with fatigue. Passepartout was wrapped in uneasy dreams of the bouncing of the day before. As for Mr. Fogg, he slumbered as peacefully as if he had been in his serene mansion in Saville Row. The journey was resumed at six in the morning. The guide hoped to reach Allahabad by evening. In that case, Mr. Fogg would only lose a part of the 48 hours saved since the beginning of the tour. Keone resumed his rapid gait, soon descended the lower spurs of the Mindias, and towards noon they passed by the village of Kalangar on the Kani, one of the branches of the, Gan uh, of the Ganges. The guide avoided inhabited places, thinking it safer to keep the open country, which lies along the first depressions of the basin of the great river. Allahabad was now only twelve miles to the northeast. They stopped under a clump of bananas, the fruit of which, as healthy as bread and as succulent as cream, was amply partaken of and appreciated. At two o'clock, the guide entered the thick forest which extended several miles. He preferred to travel under cover of the woods. They had not as yet had any unpleasant encounters, and the journey seemed on the point of being successfully accomplished, when the elephant, becoming restless, suddenly stopped. It was then four o'clock. "'What's the matter?' asked Sir Francis, putting out his head. "'I don't know, officer,' replied the Parsee, listening at attentively to a confused murmur which came through the thick branches." The murmur soon became more distinct. It now seemed like a distant concert of human voices accompanied by brass instruments. Passepartout was all eyes and ears. Mr. Fogg patiently waited without a word. The Parsee jumped to the ground, fastened the elephant to a tree, and plunged into the thicket. He soon returned, saying, The procession of Brahmins is coming this way. We must prevent their seeing thus, if possible. The guide unloosed the elephant and led them into the thicket, at the same time asking the travelers not to stir. He held himself ready to bestride the animal at a moment's notice, should flight become necessary, but he evidently thought that the procession of the faithful would pass without perceiving them amid the thick foliage in which they were wholly concealed. The discordant tones of the voices and instruments drew nearer, and now droning songs mingled with the sound of the tambourines and cymbals. The head of the procession soon appeared beneath the trees, a hundred paces away, and the strange figures, figures who performed the religious ceremony were easily disturbed, distinguished through the branches. First came the priests, with mitres on their, hands, uh, on their heads, and clothed in long lace robes. They were surrounded by men, women, and children, who sang a kind of lugubrious psalm, inter, uh, 
interrupted at regular intervals by the tambourines and cymbals, while behind them was drawn a car with long, large wheels, the spokes of which represented serpents entwined with each other. Upon the car, which was drawn by four richly uh, caparisoned ze uh, zebus, stood a hideous statue with four arms, the body colored a dull red, with haggard eyes, disheveled hair, protruding tongue, and lips tainted with be uh, beetle. It stood upright upon the figure of a prostrate and headless giant. Sir Francis recognized the statue, whispered, The goddess Kali, the goddess of love and death. Of death, perhaps, murmured Bas Pos uh, back Passepartout. But of love, that ugly old hag, never. The Parsi made a motion to keep silence. A group of old fakirs were capering and making a wild ado around the statue. These were striped with ochre and covered with cuts whence their blood issued drop by drop. Stupid fanatics who, in the great Indian ceremony, still throw themselves under the wheels of juggernaut. Some Brahmins, clad in all of the sumptuousness of oriental appear, uh, apparel, and leading a woman who faltered at every step, followed. This woman was young and as fair as a European. Her head and neck, shoulders, ears, arms, hands, and toes were loaded down with jewels and gems, with bracelets, earrings, and rings, while a tunic bordered with gold and covered with a slight muslin robe betrayed the outline of her form. The guards who followed the young woman presented a violent contrast to her, armed as they were with naked sabers hung at their waists, and long damascened pistols, and bearing a corpse, uh, a corpse of a, on a palanquin. It was the body of an old man, gorgeously arrayed in the uh, habiliments of a rajah, wearing, as in life, a turban embroidered with pearls, a robe of tissue of silk and gold, a, a scarf of cashmere sewed with diamonds, and the magnificent weapons of a Hindu prince. Next came the musicians and a rear guard of capering fakirs, whose cries sometimes drowned the noise of the instruments. Those close, uh, they, these closed the procession. Sir Francis watched the procession with a sad countenance, and, turning to the guide, said, A suti. The Parsi nodded and put his finger to his lips. The procession slowly wound under the tree, and soon its last ranks disappeared in the depths of the wood. The songs gradually died away. <clears throat> Occasionally, cries were heard in the distance, until, at last, all was silent again. Phileas Fogg had heard what Sir Francis said, and as soon as the procession was disappeared, asked, What is a suti? A suti, returned the general, is a human sacrifice, but a voluntary one. The woman you have just seen will be burned tomorrow at the day, uh, at the dawn of day. Oh, the scoundrels! cried Passepartout, who could not repre uh, repress his indignation. And the corpse? asked Mr. Fogg. Is that of the prince, her husband? said the guide, an independent rajah of Bundelkund. Is it possible, resumed Phileas Fogg, his voice betraying not the least emotion, that these barbarous customs still exist in India, and that the English have been unable to put a stop to them? These sacrifices do not occur in the larger portion of India, replied Sir Francis, but they have no power over these savage territories, and especially here in Bundelkund. The whole district north of the Vindias is the theater of incessant murder and pillage. The poor wretch, exclaimed Passepartout, to be burned alive. Yes, returned Sir Francis, burned alive. And if she were not, you cannot re conceive what treatment she would be obliged to submit from her relatives. They have sh uh, would shave off her hair, feed her on the scanty allowance of rice, treat her with contempt. She would be looked upon as an unclean creature and would die in some corner like a scurvy dog. The prospect of so frightful an existence drives these poor creatures to the sacrifice much more than love or religion, uh, religious fanaticism. Sometimes, however, the sacrifice is really voluntary, and it requires the active interference of the government to prevent it. 
Several years ago, when I was living at Bombay, a young widow asked permission of the government to be burned along with her husband's body, but, as you may imagine, he refused. The woman left the town, took refuge with an independent Raja, and there carried out her self-devoted purpose. While Sir Francis was speaking, the guide shook his head several times and now said, The sacrifice which will take place tomorrow at dawn is not a voluntary one. How do you know? Everybody knows about this affair in Bundelkund. But the wretched creature does not seem to be making any resistance, observes Sir Francis. That was because they had intoxicated her with fumes of hemp and opium. But where are they taking her? To the coat of Pilaji. Two miles from here, she will pass the night there. And the sacrifice will take place tomorrow, at the first light of dawn. The guide now led the elephant out of the thicket, and leading upon his, uh, leaped upon his back, just at the moment that he was about to urge Kiuni toward, uh, forward with a peculiar whistle. Mr. Fogg stopped him, and, turning to Sir Francis Cromarty, said, "'Suppose we save this woman.' "'Save the woman, Mr. Fogg? "'I have yet twelve hours to spare. I can devote them to that.' "'Why, you're a man of heart. Sometimes,' replied Phileas Fogg quietly, "'when I have the time.' "'Well, that was a surprise. I didn't uh, see human sacrifice and uh, drugs being brought into that.' But, uh, yeah, interesting. Chapter 13, in which Passepartout receives a new proof that fortune favors the brave. The project was a bold one, full of difficulty, perhaps impracticable. Mr. Fogg was going to risk life, or at least liberty, and therefore the success of his tour. But he did not hesitate, and he found in Sir Francis Cromarty an enthusiastic ally. As for Passepartout, he was ready for anything that might be proposed. His master's idea charmed him. He perceived a heart, a soul, under that icy exterior. It began to love. Uh, he began to love Phileas Fogg. There remained the guide. What course would he adopt? Would he not take part with the Indians? In default of his assistance, it was necessary to be assured of his uh, neutrality. Sir Francis frankly put the question to him. Officer, replied the guide, I am a Parsee, and this woman is the Parsee. Command me as you will. Excellent, said Mr. Fogg. However, resumed the guide, it is certain not only that we shall risk our lives, but horrible tortures if we are taken. That is foreseen, replied Mr. Fogg. I think we must wait till night before acting. I think so, said the guide. The worthy Indian then gave some account of the victim, who, he said, was a celebrated, a celebrated beauty of the Parsi race, and the daughter of a wealthy Bombay merchant. She had received a thoroughly English education in that city, and, from her manners and intelligence, would be thought an in European. Her name was Aouda, left an orphan. She was married against her will to the old Raja of Wundelkund, and, knowing the fate that awaited her, she escaped, was retaken, and devoted by the Raja's relatives, who had an interest in her death, to the sacrifice from which she, it seemed she would not escape. The Parsi's narrative only confirmed Mr. Fogg and his companions in their generous design. It was decided that the guide should direct the elephant towards the pagoda of Pilaji, which he accordingly approached as quickly as possible. They halted, half an hour afterwards, in a copse some five hundred feet from the pagoda, where they were well concealed. <clears throat> but they could hear the groans and cries of the fakirs distinctly. Then they discussed the means of getting at the victim. The guide was familiar with the pagoda of Pelagi, in which, as he declared, the young woman was imprisoned. But they enter any of its doors while the whole party of Indians was plunged in a drunken sleep, or was it safer to attempt to make a hole in the walls? This could only be determined at the moment, and the place themselves, but it was certain that the abduction must be made that night, and not when at 
break of day, the victims were led to their funeral pyre. Then no human intervention could save her. As soon as night fell, about six o'clock, they decided to make a reconnaissance around the pagoda. The cries of the fakir were just ceasing. The Indians were in the, the act of plunging themselves into the drunkenness caused by liquid op opium mingled with hemp, and it might be possible to slip between them to the temple itself. Again, I apologize for the uh, mentions of drug in this. Not, uh, I was not expecting that, and this book is termed 10 and up, so, yep, sorry again. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> The Parsi, leading the others, noiselessly crept through the wood, and in ten minutes they found themselves on the banks of a small stream, whence, by the light of the rosen torches, they perceived a pyre of wood, on the top of which lay the embalmed body of the Raja, which was to be burned with his wife. The pagoda, whose minarets loomed above the trees in the deepening dusk, stood a hundred steps away. Come whispered the guide. He slipped more cautiously than ever through the brush, followed by his companions. The silence around was only broken by the low rumbling of the wind among the branches. Soon the Parsi stopped on the borders of the glade, which was lit up by the torches. The ground was covered by groups of the Indians, motionless in their drunken sleep. It seemed a battlefield strewn with the dead. Men, women, and children lay together. In the background, among the trees, the pagoda of Pilaji loomed indistinctly. Much to the guide's disappointment, the guards of the Raja, lighted by torches, were watching at the doors and marching to and fro with naked sabers. Probably the priests, too, were watching within. The Parsi, now convinced that it was impossible to force an entrance to the temple, advanced no further, but led his companions back again. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty also saw that nothing could be attempted in that direction. They stopped and engaged in a whispered colloquy. It is only eight now, said the brigadier, and these guards may also go to sleep. It is not impossible, returned the Parsi. They lay down at the foot of the tree and waited. The time seemed long. The guide ever and anon left them to take an observation on the edge of the wood, but the guards watched steadily by the glare of the torches, and a dim light crept through the windows of the pagoda. They waited till midnight, but no change took place among the guards, and it became apparent that their yielding to sleep could not be counted on. The other plan must be carried out. An opening in the walls of the pagoda must be made. It remained to ascertain whether the priests were watched by the side of their victim as assiduously as the, were the soldiers at the door. After a last consultation, the guide announced that he was ready for the attempt and advanced, followed by the others. They took a roundabout way, so as to get at the pagoda on the rear. They reached the wall about half past twelve without having met anyone. Here there was no guard, nor were there either windows or doors. The night was dark. The moon on the wane scarcely left the horizon and was covered with heavy clouds. The height of the trees deepened the darkness. It was not enough to reach the walls. An opening in them must be accomplished, and to attain this purpose, the party only had their pocket knives. Happily, the temple walls were built of brick and wood, which could be penetrated with little difficulty. After one brick had been taken out, the rest would yield easily. They set noiselessly to work, and the Parsi on one side and Passepartout on the other began to loosen the bricks so as to make an aperture two feet wide. They were getting on rapidly when suddenly a cry was heard in the interior of the temple, followed almost instantly instantly by other cries replying from the outside. Passepartout and the guide stopped. Had they been heard? Was the alarm being given? Common procedure urged them to retire, and they did so, followed by Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis. They again hid themselves in the wood and waited till the disturbance, 
where uh, whatever it might be, ceasing, holding themselves ready to resume their attempt without delay. But, awkwardly enough, the guards now appeared at the rear of the temple and there, inst and there installed themselves in readiness to prevent a surprise. It would be difficult to describe the disappointment of the party, these interrupted in their, thus interrupted in their work. They could not now reach the victim. Now then, could, uh, how then could they save her? Sir Francis shook his fists. Passepartout was beside himself, and the guide gnashed his teeth with rage. The tranquil fog waited without betraying any emotion. Uh, any emotion. We have nothing to do but go away," whispered Sir Francis. "Nothing but to go away," echoed the guide. "Stop," said Fogg. "I am only due at Allahabad tomorrow before noon." "But what? What can you hope to do?" asked Sir Francis. In a few hours it will be daylight, and the chance which now seems lost may present itself at the last moment. Sir Francis would have liked to read Phileas Fogg's eyes. What was this cool Englishman thinking of? Was he planning to make a rush for the young woman at the very moment of the sacrifice and boldly snatch her from her executioners? This would be utter folly, and it was hard to admit that Fogg was such a fool. Sir Francis consented, however, to remain to the end of this terrible drama. The guide led them to the rear of the glade, where they were able to observe the sleeping groups. Meanwhile, Passepartout, who had reached himself, uh, perched himself on the lower branches of a tree, was revolving an idea which had to, at first struck him like a flash, and which was now firmly lodged in his brain. He had commenced by saying to himself, What folly! And then he repeated, Oh, why not, after all? It's a chance, perhaps the only one, and with such sots. Thinking thus, he slipped with the suppleness of a serpent to the lowest branches, the ends of which bent almost to the ground. The hours passed, and the lighter shades now announced the approach of day, though it was not yet light. This was the moment. The slumbering multitude became animated. The tambourines sounded. Songs and cries arose. The hour of the sacrifice had come. The doors of the pagoda swung open, and a bright light escaped from its interior, in the midst of which Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis espied the victim. She seemed, having shaken off the stupor of intoxication, to be striving to escape from her executioner. Sir Francis' heart throbbed, and convulsively, uh, convulsively seizing Mr. Fogg's hand, found it in an open knife. Uh, found in it an open knife. Just at this moment, the crowd began to move. The young woman had again fallen into a stupor caused by the fumes of hemp, and passed along the fakirs who escorted her with their wild religious cries. Phileas Fogg had his companions, mingling in the rear ranks of the crowd, followed, and in two minutes they reached the banks of the stream, and stopped fifty paces from the pyre upon which still lay the Rajah's corpse. In the semi-obscurity they saw the victim, quite senseless, stretched out beside her husband's body. Then a torch was brought, and the wood, soaked with oil, instantly took fire. At this moment, Sir Francis and the guide seized Phileas Fogg, who, in an instant of mad generosity, was about to rush upon the pyre. But he had quickly pushed them aside, when the whole scene suddenly changed. A cry of terror arose. The whole multitude prostrated themselves, terror-stricken on the ground. The old Raja was not dead, then, since he rose of a sudden, like a scepter, Look, uh, took up his wife in his arms, and descended from the pyre in the midst of the clouds of smoke, which only heightened his ghostly appearance. Fakirs and soldiers and priests, seized with instant terror, lay there, with their faces on the ground, not daring to lift their eyes and behold such a prodigy. The inanimate victim was borne along by the vigorous arms which supported her, and which she did not uh, seem in the least to burden. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis stood erect, the Parsee bowed his head, and Passepartout was, no doubt, scarcely less stupefied. 
The resuscitated Raja approached Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg, and in an abrupt tone said, Let us be off. It was Passepartout himself, who had slipped upon the pyre in the midst of the smoke, and profiting by the still overhanging darkness, had delivered the young woman from death. It was Passepartout who, playing his part with a happy audacity, had passed through the crowd amid the general terror. A moment after all four of the party had disappeared in the woods, and the elephant was bearing them away at a rapid pace. But the cries and noise, and a ball which whizzed through Phileas Fogg's hat, apprised them that the trick had been discovered. The old Rajah's body, indeed, now appeared upon the upon the burning pyre, and the priests, recovered from their terror, perceived that an abduction had taken place. They hastened into the forest, followed by the soldiers, who fired a volley after the fugitives, but the latter rapidly increased the distance between them, and ere long found themselves beyond the reach of the bullets and arrows. Chapter 14, in which Phyllis Fogg descends the whole length of the beautiful valley of the Ganges without ever thinking of seeing it. The rash exploit was a, had been accomplished, and for an hour Passepartout laughed gaily at his success. Sir Francis pressed the worthy fellow's hand and said, uh, and his master said, Well done, which from him was high commendation to which Passepartout replied that all the credit of the affair belonged to Mr. Fogg. As for him, he had only been struck with a queer idea, and he laughed to think that for a few moments he, Passepartout, the ex-gymnast, ex-sergeant fireman, had been the spouse of a charming woman, a venerable embalmed Raja. As for the young Indian woman, she had been unconscious throughout of what it was passing, and now, wrapped up in a traveling blanket, was reposing in one of the huda, uh, howdahs. The elephant, thanks to the skillful guidance of the Parsi, was advancing rapidly through the still darksome forest, and an hour after leaving the pagoda, had crossed a vast plain. They made a halt at seven o'clock, the young woman being still in a state of complete prostration. The guide made her drink a little brandy and water, but the drowsiness which stupefied her could not yet be shaken off. Sir Francis, who was familiar with the effects of the intoxication produced by the fumes of hemp, reassured his companions that it, on her account, but he was more disturbed at the prospect of her future fate. He told Phileas Fogg that, should Aouda remain in India, she would inevitably fall again into the hands of her executioners. These fanatics were scattered throughout the country, and would, despite the English police, recover their victim at Madras, Bombay, or Calcutta. She would only be safe by quitting India forever. Phileas Fogg replied that he would reflect upon the matter the station at Allahabad was reached about ten o'clock, and the interrupted line of railway being resumed would ex uh, enable them to reach Calcutta in less than twenty-four hours. Phileas Fogg would thus be able to arrive in time to take the steamer, which left Calcutta the next day, October 25th, at noon, for Hong Kong. The young woman was placed in one of the waiting rooms of the station, whilst Passepartout was chain, uh, charged with purchasing for her various articles of toilet, a dress, shawl, and some furs, for which his master gave him unlimited credit. Passepartout started off forthwith, and found himself in the streets of Allahabad, that is, the City of God, one of the most venerated in India being built at the junction of the two sacred rivers Ganges and Jumna, the waters of which attract pilgrims from every part of the peninsula. The Ganges, according to the legends of the Ramayana, rises in heaven, whence, owing to Brahma's agency, it descends to the earth. Passepartout made it a point, as he made his purchase, to take a good look at the city. It was formerly defended by a, noble, uh, by a noble fort, which was since became a state prison. Its commerce was dwindled away, 
and Passepartout in vain looked about him for such a bazaar as he used to frequent in Regent Square, uh, Regent Suite, uh, sorry, Regent Street. Uh, now I've lost my, oh, there we go. At last he came upon an elderly, crusty Jew who sold second-hand articles, and from whom he purchased a dress of Scotch stuff a large mantle, and a fine otter-skin pelisse, for which he did not hesitate to pay seventy-five pounds. He then returned triumphantly to the station. The influence to which the priests of Pilaji had subjected Aouda became gradually to, began gradually to yield, and she became more herself, so that her fine eyes resumed all their soft Indian expression. When the poet king, Ukaf, uh, Ulaul, uh, Udal celebrated the charms of the queen of uh, Amengara. He thus said, uh, he speaks thus, her shining tresses divided in two parts encircled the harmonious contours of her white and delicate cheeks, brilliant in their glow and freshness. Her ebony brows have the form and charm of the ba uh, bow of Kama, the god of love. Oh, bow, yeah the bow of Kama, the god of love, and beneath her long silken lashes the purest reflections of a celestial light swim, as in the sacred lakes of Himalaya, in the dark, uh, in the black pupils of their great clear eyes. Her teeth, fine, equal, and white, glitter between her smiling lips like dewdrops in a passion flower's half-enveloped breast. Her delicately formed ears, her vermilion hands, her little feet, curved and tender as the lotus bud, glitter with the brilliancy of the loveliest pearls of Ceylon, the most dazzling diamonds of Golconda. Her narrow and supple waist, which a hand may clasp round, sets forth the outline of her rounded figure and the beauty of her bosom. Where youth is in, uh, where youth in its flower display, displays the wealth of its treasures, and beneath the silken folds of her tunic she seems to have been modeled in pure silver by the godlike hand of Vikvark Harma, and immor uh, the immortal sculptor. It is enough to say, without applying this poetical rhapsody to Aouda, that she was a charming woman in all the European acceptations of the phrase. She spoke English with great purity, and the guide had not exaggerated in saying that the young Parsee had been transformed by her bringing up. The train was about to start from Allahabad, and Mr. Fogg proceeded to pay the guide the price agreed upon for his service, and not a farthing more, which astonished Passepartout, who remembered all that his master owed to the guide's devotion. He had indeed risked his life in the adventure in Pillaji, and if he should be caught afterwards by the Indians, he would with difficulty escape their vengeance. Uni also must be disposed of. What should be done with the elephant, which had been so dearly purchased? Phileas Fogg had already determined this question. Percy, he said to the guide, you have been serviceable and devoted. I have paid for your service, but not for your devotion. Would you like to have this elephant? He is yours. The gui guide's eyes glittered. Your honor is giving me a fortune, cried he. Take him, guide, returned Mr. Fogg, and I shall still be your debtor. Good, exclaimed Passepartout. Take him, friend. Cuny is a brave and faithful beast. And going up to the elephant, he gave him several lumps of sugar, saying, Here, Cuny, here, here, here. The elephant grunted out his satisfaction and, clasped, clasping Passepartout around the waist with his trunk, lifted him as high as his head. Passepartout, not in the least alarmed, caressed the animal, which replaced him gently on the ground. Soon after, Phileas Fogg, Sir Francis Cromarty, and Passepartout, installed in a carriage with Aouda, who had the best seat, were whirling at a full speed towards Benares. It was a run of eighty miles, and was accomplished in two hours. During the journey, the young woman fully recovered her senses. What was her astonishment to find herself in this carriage, on the railway, dressed in European, uh, European habiliments, 
and with travelers who are quite strangers to her. Her companions first set about fully reviving her with a little liquor, and then Sir Francis narrated to her what had passed, dwelling upon the courage with which Phileas Fogg had not hesitated to risk his life to save her, and recounting the happy sequel of the venture, the result of Passepartout's rash idea. Mr. Fogg said nothing, while Passepartout, abashed, kept repeating that it, it wasn't worth telling. Aouda pathetically thanked her deliverers, rather with tears than words. Her fine eyes interpreted her gratitude better than her lips. Then, as her thoughts strayed back to the scene of the sacrifice and recalled the dangers which still menaced her, she shuddered with terror. Phileas Fogg understood what was passing in Aouda's mind and offered, in order to reassure her, to escort her to Hong Kong, where she might remain safely until the affair was hushed up. An offer which she eagerly and gratefully accepted. She had, it seemed, a Parsi relation, who was one of the principal merchants of Hong Kong, which is wholly an English city, though on an island of the Chinese coast. At half-past twelve, the train stopped at Benares. The Brahmin legends asserted that this city is built on the site of the ancient Kasi, which, like Mohammed's tomb, was uh, once suspended between heaven and earth, though the Benares of today, which the Orientals call the Athens of India, stands quite unpoetically on the solid earth. Passepartout caught glimpses of its brick houses and clay huts, giving it an aspect of desolation to the place as the train entered it. Benares was Sir, uh, Sir Francis Cromarty's destination, the troops he was rejoining being encamped some miles northward of the city. He bade adieu to Phileas Fogg, wishing him all success and expressing the hope that he would come that way again in a less original but more profitable fashion. Mr. Fogg lightly pressed him by the hand. The parting of Aouda, who did not forget that she, what she owed to Sir Francis, betrayed more warmth, and, as for Passepartout, he received a hearty shake of the hand from that gallant general. The railway, on leaving Benares, passed for a while along the valley of the Ganges, through the windows of their carriage, and tra uh, the travelers had glimpses of the diversified landscape of Bihar, with its mountains clothed in verdure, uh, verdure, its fields of barley, wheat, and corn, its jungles peopled with green alligators, its neat villages, and its still thickly-leaved forests. Elephants were bathing in the waters of the sacred river, and groups of Indians, despite the advancement uh, advanced season in chilly air, were performing solemnly their pious ablutions. These were fervent Brahmins, the bitterest foes of Buddhism, their deities being Vishnu, the solar god Shiva, the defined impersonation of natural forces, and Brahma, the supreme ruler of priests and legisl uh, legislators. What would these divinities think of India? anglicized as it is today, with steamers whistling and scuttling along the Ganges, frightening the gulls which float upon its surface, the turtles swimming along its banks, and the faithful dwelling upon its borders. The panorama passed between, before their eyes like a flash, save when the steam concealed it few, uh, fitfully from the view. The travelers could scarcely discern the fort of uh, Chupeni, uh, Twenty miles southwards from Benares, the ancient stronghold of the Rajas of Bihar, or Ghazipur, and its famous rose water factories, or the tomb of Lord Cornwallis, rising on the left bank of the Ganges, the fortified town of Buxar, uh, Buxar, yeah, or Patna, a large manufacturing and trading place, where is held the principal opium market of India or Mongir, a more than European town, for it is as English as Manchester or Birmingham, with its iron fortress uh, foundries, yeah, with its iron foundries, edge tool factories, and high chimneys puffing clouds of black smoke heavenward. Night came on, 
The train passed on at full speed in the midst of the roaring of the tigers, bears, and wolves, which fled before the locomotive, and the marvels of Bengal, Golconda, uh, ruined Gaur, Murshab, Marshadabad, the ancient capital, Bourdouin, Hughley, and the French town of Chandernagor, where Passepartout would have been proud to see his country's flag flying, were hidden from their view in the darkness. Calcutta has, was reached at seven in the morning, and the packet left for Hong Kong at noon, so that Phileas Fogg had five hours before him. According to his journal, he was due at Calcutta on the 25th of October, and that was the exact date of his actual arrival. He was therefore neither behindhand nor ahead of time. The two days gained between London and Bombay had been lost, as has been seen in the journey across India, but it is not to be supposed that Phileas Fogg regretted them. I see we have four viewers. Thank you for joining me, and um, I hope you are enjoying yourself. I'm going to continue on. Chapter 15, in which the bag of banknotes disgorges some thousands of pounds more. The train entered the station, and Passepartout, jumping out first, was followed by Mr. Fogg, who assisted his fair companion to descend. Phileas Fogg intended to proceed at once to the Hong Kong steamer, in order to get Aouda comfortably settled for the voyage. He was unwilling to leave her while they were still on dangerous ground. Just as he was leaving the station, a policeman came up to him and said, Mr. Phileas Fogg, I am he. Is this man your servant? added the police, pointing to Passepartout. Yes. Be so good, both of you, as to follow me. Mr. Pa uh, Fogg betrayed no surprise whatever. The policeman was a representative of the law, and law is sacred to an Englishman. Passepartout tried to reason out the matter, for the policeman trapped him with his stick, and Mr. Fogg made him a signal to obey. May this young lady go with us? asked he. She may, replied the policeman. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout were conducted to a palki gari, a sort of four-wheeled carriage drawn by two horses in which they took their places and were driven away. No one spoke during the twenty minutes which elapsed before they reached their destination. They first passed through the black town into its narrow streets, its miserable dirty huts, and squalid population, then through the European town, with, and these are in quotes, which presented a, re a relief in its black, uh, bright brick mansions shaded by coconut trees and bristling with masts, where, although it was early morning, elegantly dressed horsemen in uh, handsome uh, equi equipages were passing back and forth. The carriage stood before a modest-looking house, which, however, did not have the appearance of a private mansion. The policeman, having requested his prisoners, for so truly they might be called, to descend, conducted them into a room with barred windows, and said, You will appear for, before Judge Obadiah of half, at half-past eight. He then retired and closed the doors. Why are we prisoners? exclaimed Passepartout, falling into a chair. Aouda, with an emotion she tried to conceal, said to Mr. Fogg, "'Sir, you must leave me to my fate. "'It is on my account that you received this treatment. "'It is for having saved me.' Phileas Fogg contented himself with saying "'that it was impossible. "'It was quite unlikely that he should be arrested "'for preventing a suttee. The, comp uh, "'The complainants would not dare present themselves "'with such a charge. "'There was some mistake.' Moreover, he would not in any event abandon Aouda, but would escort her to Hong Kong. "'But the steamer leaves at noon,' observed Passepartout nervous, nervously. "'We shall be on board by noon,' replied his master placidly. It was said so positively that Passepartout could not help muttering to himself, "'Pas bleu, that's certain. Before noon we shall be on board.' 
but he was by no means reassured. At half past eight, the door opened, the policeman appeared and requested them to follow him, led, uh, led the way to an adjoining hall. It was evidently a courtroom, and a crowd of Europeans and natives already occupied the rear of the apartment. Mr. Fogg and his two companions took their places on the bench opposite the desk of the magistrate and his clerk. Immediately after, Judge Obadiah, a fat, round man, followed by the clerk, entered. He proceeded to take down a wig which was hanging on a nail, and put it hurriedly on his head. The first case, said he, then putting his hand to his head, he exclaimed, ha, This is not my wig. No, your worship, returned the clerk. Uh, the clerk. It is mine. My dear Mr. Oysterpuff, how can a judge give a wise sentence in a clerk's wig? The wigs were exchanged. Passepartout was getting nervous, for the hands on the face of the big clock over the judge seemed to go round with terrible rapidity. The first case, repeated Judge Obadiah. Phileas Fogg demanded Oyster Puff. I am here, replied Mr. Fogg. Passepartout, present, uh, responded Passepartout. Good, said the judge. You have been looked for, in uh, prisoners, for two days on the trains from Bombay. But of what are we accused? asked Passepartout impatiently. You are about to be informed. I am an English subject, sir, said Mr. Fogg, and I have the right... Have you been ill-treated? Not at all. Very well, let the complaints come in. A door was swung open by order of the judge, and three Indian priests entered. That's it, muttered Passepartout. These are the rogues who are trying to burn our la young lady. The priests took their place in front of the judge, and the clerks proceeded to read in a loud voice a complaint of sacrilege against Phileas Fogg and his servant, who were accused of having violated a place held conse uh, consecrated by the Brahmin religion. "'You hear the charge?' asked the judge. "'Yes, sir,' replied Mr. Fogg, consulting his watch, and I admit it. "'You admit it? I admit it, and I wish to hear these priests admit, in their turn, what they were going to do with the pagoda of Pelagi. The priests looked at each other. They did not seem to understand what was said. Yes, cried Passepartout warmly, at the pagoda of Pelagi, where they were on the point of burning their victim. The judge stared with astonishment, and the priests were stupefied. What victim? said Judge Obadiah. Born whom? In Bombay itself? Bombay, cried Passepartout. Certainly we are not talking of the pagoda of Pelagi, but of the pagoda of Malabar Hill at Bombay. And as proof, added the clerk, here are the des uh, desecrator's shoe, uh, very shoes which he left behind him. Whereupon he placed a pair of shoes on his desk. My shoes, cried Passepartout, in his surprise, permitting his imprudent exclamation to escape him. The confusion of master and man, who had quite forgotten the affair of Bombay, for which they were now detained at Calcutta, may be imagined. Fix, the detective, had foreseen the advantage which Passepartout's escapade gave him, and delayed his departure for twelve hours, and consulted the priests of Malabar Hill, Knowing that the English authorities dealt very severely with this kind of misdemeanor, he promised them a goodly sum in damages, and sent them forward to Calcutta by the next train. Owing to the delay caused by the rescue of the young widow, Fix and his priests reached the Indian capital before Mr. Fogg and his servant, the magistrates having been already warned by a despatch to arrest him should they arrive. Fix's disappointment when he learned that Phileas Fogg had not made his appearance in Calcutta may be imagined. He made up his mind that the robber had stopped somewhere on the route and taken refuge in the southern provinces. For twenty-four hours Fix watched the station with feverish anxiety. At last he was rewarded by seeing Mr. Fogg and Passepartout arrive, accompanied by a young woman, whose presence he was wholly at a loss to explain. He hastened for a policeman, and this was how the party came to be arrested and brought before Judge Obadiah. 
Had Passepartout been a little less preoccupied, he would have espied the detective ensconced in a corner of the courtroom, watching the proceedings with an interest easily understood. For the warrant had failed to reach him at Calcutta, as it had done at Bombay and Suez. Judge Obadiah had unfortunately caught Passepartout's rash explanation. Oh, goodness. Judge Obadiah had unfortunately caught Passepartout's rash exclamation, which the poor fellow would have given the world to recall. The facts are admitted, asked the judge. Admitted, replied Mr. Fogg coldly. It is much, resumed the judge, as the English law protects equally the, and sternly the religions of the Indian people, and as the man Passepartout has admitted that he violated the sacred pagoda of Malabar Hill at Bombay on the 20th of October, I condemn the said Passepartout to imprisonment for 15 days and a fine of 300 pounds. 300 pounds, cried Passepartout, startled by the largeness of the sum. Silence, shouted the constable. And inasmuch, continued the judge, it is as, uh, as it is not proved that the act was not done by the connivance of the master of the servant, uh, with the servant, and as the master, uh, in any case, must be held responsible for the acts of his paid servant, I condemn Phileas Fogg to a week's imprisonment and a fine of one hundred and fifty pounds. Fix rubbed his hands softly with satisfaction. If Phileas Fogg could be detained in Calcutta a week, it would be more than time for the warrant to arrive. Passepartout was stupefied. Yet this silence, uh, this sentence ruined his master. A wager of twenty thousand pounds lost because he, like a precious fool, had gone into that abominable pagoda. Phileas Fogg, as self-composed as if the judgment did not in the least concern him, did not even lift his eyebrows while it was being pronounced, but as the clerk was calling the next case, he rose and said, I offer bail. You have that right, returned the judge. Fix's blood ran cold, but he resumed his composure when he heard the judge announce that the bail required for each prisoner would be one thousand pounds. I will pay at once, said Mr. Fogg taking a roll of bank bills from the carpet bag, which Passepartout had by him, and placing them on the de uh, clerk's desk. This sum will be restored to you upon your release from prison, said the judge. Meanwhile, you are liberated on bail. Come, said Phileas Fogg to his servant. But let them at least give me back my shoes, cried Passepartout angrily. Ah, these are pretty dear shoes, he muttered as they were handed to him. More than a thousand pounds apiece, besides, they pinch my feet. Mr. Fogg offered his arm to Aouda, then departed, followed by the crestfallen Passepartout. Fix still nourished hopes that the robber would not, after all, leave the two thousand pounds behind him, but would decide to serve out his week in jail, and issued forth on Mr. Fogg's traces. That gentleman took a carriage, and the party were soon landed on one of the quays. The Rangoon was moored half a mile off in the harbor, and its signal of departure hoisted at the masthead. Eleven o'clock was striking. Mr. Fogg was an hour in advance of time. Fix saw them leave the carriage and push off in a boat for the steamer, and stamped his feet with disappointment. "'Rascal is off after all!' he exclaimed. Two thousand pounds sacrificed!' He's as prodigal as a thief. I'll follow him to the end of the world if necessary, but at the rate he is going on, the stolen money will soon be exhausted. The detective was not far wrong in making his, this conjecture. Since leaving London, with its traveling expenses, bribes, the purchase of the elephant, bales, and fines, Mr. Fogg had already spent more than five thousand pounds on the way, and the per uh, percentage of the sum recovered from the bank robber promised to the detectives was rab uh, rapidly diminishing. Chapter 16, in which Fix does not seem to understand in the least what is said to him.
The Ragoon, one of the Peninsular and Oriental Company's boats plying in the Chinese and Japanese seas, was a screw steamer built of iron, weighing about 1,770 tons, and with engines of 400 horsepower. She was as fast, but not as well fitted up as the Mongolia, and Aouda was not as comfortably provided for on board of, uh, uh, of her as Mr. Hang on a second. And Aouda was not as comfortably provided for on board of her as Phileas Fogg would have wished. Uh, however, the trip from Calcutta to Hong Kong only comprised some 3,500 miles, accompanying from uh, occupying from 10 to 12 days, and the young woman was not difficult to please. During the first days of the journey, Aouda became better acquainted with her protector and constantly gave evidence of her deep gratitude for, which he was, had, for what he had done. The phlegmatic gentleman listened to her, apparently at least, with coldness, neither his voice nor his manner betraying the slightest emotion. But he seemed to be always on the watch that nothing should be wanting to Aouda's comfort. He listened her, uh, he visited her regularly, each day at certain hours, not so much to talk himself as to sit and hear her talk. He treated her with the strictest politeness, but with the precision of an automaton, the movements of which had been arranged for this purpose. Aouda did not quite know what to make of him, though Passepartout had given her some hints of his master's eccentricity, and made her smile by telling her of the wager, uh, wager which was sending him round the world. After all, she owed Phileas Fogg her life, and she always regarded him through the exalting medium of her gratitude. Aouda confirmed the Parsi guide's narrative of her touching history. She did, indeed, belong to the highest of the native races of India. Many of the Parsi merchants have, been made, uh, have made great fortunes there by dealing in cotton, and one of them, Sir Jamatsi Jijiboy, uh, was made a baronet by the English government. Aouda was a relative of this great man, and it was his cousin, Jiji, uh, Jiji whom she hoped to jo uh, join at Hong Kong. Whether she would find a protector in him, she could not tell, but Mr. Fogg essayed to claim her anxiety, uh, calm her anxieties, and to assure that her that every oh goodness, this is a tongue twister and to assure her that everything would be mathematically, he used the very word, arranged. Aouda fastened her eyes, uh, her great eyes, clear as the sacred lights of the Himalaya, upon him, but the intractable fog, as reserved as ever, did not seem at all inclined to throw himself into this lake. The first few days of the voyage passed pro uh, prosperously, amid favorable weather and propit uh, propitious winds, and they soon came in sight of the great Andaman, the principal of the islands in the Bombay of Bengal, oh, in the Bay of Bengal, with its picturesque saddle peak, 2,400 uh, feet high, looming above the waters. The steamer passed along near the shores, but the savage Papuans, who are in the lowest scale of human, uh, humanity, but are not, as has been uh, asserted, cannibals, did not make their appearance. The panorama of the islands as they steamed by them was superb. Vast forests of palms, eryx, bamboo, teakwood, of the gigantic mimosa, the tree-like ferns covered the fore uh, foreground, while behind the graceful outlines of the mountains were traced against the sky. And along the coasts, warmed by the thousands, the precious swallows whose nests furnished a luxurious dish to the table of the Celestial Empire, the varied landscape afforded by the Andaman Islands was soon passed, however, and the Ragoon rapidly approached the Straits of Malacca, with their, uh, which give access to the China Sea. What was Detective Fix, so unluckily drawn on from the country to country, doing all this time? 
he had managed to embark on the Rangoon at Calcutta without being seen by Papspatu after leaving orders that, if the warrant should arrive, it should be forwarded to him at Hong Kong, and he hoped to conceal his presence to the end of the voyage. It would have been difficult to explain why he was on board without as uh, awakening Passepartout's suspicions, who thought him still at Bombay. But necessity impelled him, nevertheless, to renew his acquaintance with the worthy servant, as will be seen. All the detective's hopes and wishes were now centered on Hong Kong, for the steamer's stay at Singapore would be too brief to enable him to take any steps there. The arrest must be made at Hong Kong, or the robber would probably escape him forever. Hong Kong was the last English ground on which he would set foot. Beyond China, uh, beyond China, Japan, America offered to Fogg an almost certain refuge. If the warrant would at last make its appearance at Hong Kong, Fix could arrest him and give him into the hands of the local police, and there would be no further trouble. But beyond Hong Kong, a simple warrant would be of no avail. No extradition warrant would be necessary, and that would result in delays and obstacles, of which the rascal would take advantage to elude justice. Fix thought over these probabilities during the long hours which he spent in his cabin, and kept repeating to himself, Now either the warrant will be at Hong Kong, in which case I shall arrest my man, or will not be there. And this time it is absolutely necessary that I should delay his departure. I have failed at Bombay, and I have failed at Calcutta. If I fail at Hong Kong, my reputation is lost. Cost what it may, I must succeed. How shall I prevent his departure, if that should turn out to be my last resource? Fix made up his mind that, if worst came to worst, he would make a, com a confidant of Passepartout and tell him what kind of a fellow his master really was. That Passepartout was not Fogg's accomplice, he was very certain. The servant, enlightened by his disclosure and afraid of being himself implicated in crime, would doubtless become an ally of the detective. But this method was a dangerous one, only to be employed when everything else had failed. A word from Passepartout to his master would ruin all. The detective was therefore in a sore strait. But suddenly a new idea struck him. The presence of Aouda on the Rangoon in company with Phileas Fogg gave him new material for reflection. Who was this woman? What combination of events had made her Fogg's traveling companion? They had evidently met somewhere between Bombay and Calcutta, but where? Had they met accidentally, or had Fogg uh, gone into the interior purposely in quest of this charming damsel? Fix was fairly puzzled. He asked himself whether there had not been a wicked elopement, and this idea so impressed itself upon his mind that he determined to make use of the supposed intrigue. Whether the young woman were married or not, he would be able to create such difficulties for Mr. Fogg at Hong Kong that he would not escape by paying any amount of money. But could he even wait till they reached Hong Kong? Fogg had an abominable way of jumping from one boat to another, and, before anything could be effected, might get full under way again for Yokohama. Sorry, clenching my throat. Fix decided that he must warn the English authorities and signal the Rangoon before their arrival. This was easy to do, since the steamer stopped at Singapore, whence there was a telegraph wire to Hong Kong. He finally resolved, moreover, before acting more positively, to question Passepartout. It would not be difficult to make him talk, and as there was no time to lose, Fix prepared to make himself known. It was now the 30th of October, and on the following day the Rangoon was due at Singapore. Fix emerged from its cabin and went on deck. Passepartout was promenading up and down in the forward part of the steamer. The detective rushed forward with every appearance of extreme surprise and exclaimed, You here, on the Rangoon? 
What, what, Mr. Fix, are you on board? Returned the really astonished Passepartout, recognized his crony of the Mongolia. Why, I left you at Bombay, and here you are, on the way to Hong Kong. Are you going round the world, too? No, no, replied Fix. I shall stop at Hong Kong, at least for some days. Hmm, said Passepartout, who seemed for an instant perplexed. But how is it I have not seen you on board since we left Calcutta? Oh, trifle of seasickness. I've been staying in my berth. The Gulf of Bengal does not agree with me as well as the Indian Ocean. And how is Mr. Fogg? As well as and as punctual as ever, not a day behind time. But, Monsieur Fix, you don't know that we have a young lady with us. A young lady, replied the detective, not seeming to comprehend what was said. Passepartout, upon recounting Aouda's history, the affair at the Bombay Pagoda, the purchase of the elephant for two thousand pounds, the rescue, the arrest and silence of uh, sentence of the Calcutta court, and the restoration of Mr. Fogg and himself to liberty on bail. Fix, who was familiar with the last events, seemed to be equally ignorant of all that Passepartout related, and the latter was charmed to find so interested a listener. But does your master propose to carry this young woman to Europe? Not at all. We are simply going to place her under the protection of one of her relatives, a rich merchant at Hong Kong. Nothing to be done there, said Fix to himself, concealing his disappointment. Glass of gin, Mr. Passepartout? Willingly, Monsieur Fix. I must at least have a friendly glass on board the Rangoon. Chapter 17. Showing what happens on the voyage from Singapore to Hong Kong. The detective and Passepartout met often on deck after this interview, though Fix was reserved and did not attempt to induce his companion to divulge any more facts concerning Mr. Fogg. He caught a glimpse of that mysterious gentleman once or twice, but Mr. Fogg usually confined himself to the cabin where he kept Aouda company, or, accordingly, to his invener uh, invener inveterate habit, took a hand at whist. Passepartout began very seriously to conjecture that strange chance kept Fix still on the route that his master was pursuing. It was really worth the considering why this certainty, uh, why this certainly very amiable and complacent person whom he had first met at Suez had then recount, uh, recountered on board the Mongolia, who disembarked at Bombay, which he acknowledged as his destination, and now turned up so unexpectedly on the Rangoon, was following Mr. Fogg's track step by step. What was Fix's object? Passepartout was ready to wager his Indian shoes, which he religiously preserved, that Fix would also leave Hong Kong at the same time with them, and probably on the same steamer. Passepartout might have cudgelled his brain for a century without hitting upon the real object which the detective had in view. He never could have imagined that Phileas Fogg was being tracked as a robber around the globe. But, as it is in human nature to attempt the solution of every mystery, Passepartout suddenly discovered an explanation of Fix's movements, which was in truth far from unreasonable. Fix, he thought, could only be an agent of Mr. Fogg's friends at the Reform Club, sent to follow him up and to ascertain that he really went round the world as he had been, as had been agreed upon. It's clear, repeated the worthy servant to himself, proud of his shrewdness. He's a spy sent to keep us in view. That isn't quite the thing either, to be spying Mr. Fogg, who is so honorable a man. Ah, gentlemen of the reform, this shall cost you dear. Passepartout, enchanted with his discovery, resolved to say nothing to his master, lest he should, uh, lest he should be justly offended at this mistrust on the part of his advisories. But he, administ uh, he determined to chaff Fix, when he had the chance, with mysterious allusions which, however, need not betray his real suspicions. During the afternoon of Wednesday, October 30th, the Rangoon entered the Strait of Malacca, 
which separates the peninsula of that name from Sumatra. The mountainous and craggy inlets, uh, islets uh, intercept the beauties of this noble island from the view of the travelers. The Rangoon weighed anchor at Singapore the next day at 4 a.m. to receive coal, having gained half a day on the prescribed time of her arrival. Phileas Fogg noticed, uh, noted his gain in his journal, and then, accompanied by Aouda, who betrayed a desire for a walk on the shore, disembarked. Fix, who suspected Mr. Fogg's every movement, followed them cautiously, without being himself perceived, while Passepartout, laughing at his sleeve at Fix's maneuvers, went about his usual errand. The island of Singapore is not imposing in aspect, for there are no mountains, yet its appearance is not without uh, attractions. It is a park checkered by pleasant highways and avenues. A handsome carriage drawn by a sleek pair of New Holland horses carried Phileas Fogg and Aouda into the midst of rows of palms with brilliant foliage and of clove trees whereupon the cloves form the heart of a half-open flower. Pepper plants replaced the prickly hedges of European fields. Sago bushes, uh, bushes, large ferns with gorgeous branches, varied the aspect of this tropical clime, while nutmeg trees in full foliage filled the air with a penetrating perfume. Agile and grinning bands of monkeys skipped about in the trees, nor were tigers wanting in the jungle. After a drive of two hours through the country, Aouda and Mr. Fogg returned to the town, which is a vast collection of heavy-looking, irregular houses, surrounded by charming gardens, rich in tropical fruits and plants, and at ten o'clock they re-embarked, closely followed by the detective, who had kept them constantly in sight. Passepartout, who had been purchasing several dozen mangoes, a fruit as large as good-sized apples, of a dark brown color outside and bright red within, and whose white pulp melting in the mouth affords gourmands a delicious sensation, was waiting for them on the deck. He was only too glad to offer some mangoes to Aouda, who thanked him very graciously for them. At eleven o'clock, the Rangoon strode, uh, rode off of Singapore Harbor, and in a few hours, the high mountains of Malacca, with their forests inhabited by the most beautifully furred tigers in the world, were lost to view. Singapore is distant some thirteen hundred miles from the island of Hong Kong, which is a little English colony near the Chinese coast. Phileas Fogg hoped to accomplish the journey in six days, so as to be in time for the steamer which would leave on the 6th of November for Yokohama, the principal Japanese port. The Rangoon had a large quota of passengers, many of whom disembarked at Singapore, among them a number of Indians, Ceylonese, Chinamen, Malays, and Portuguese, mostly second-class travelers. The weather, which had hitherto been fine, changed with the last quarter of the moon. The sea rolled heavily, and the wind at intervals rolled, uh, rose almost to a storm, but happily blew from the southwest and thus aided the steamer's progress. The captain, as soon as possible, put up his sails, and under the double action of steam and sail, the vessel made rapid progress along the coasts of um, Annam and Cochin, China. Owing to the defective uh, construction of the Rangoon, however, unusual precautions became necessary in unfavorable weather. But the loss of time which resulted from this cause, while it nearly drove Passepartout out of his senses, did not seem to affect his master in the least. Passepartout blamed the captain, the engineer, and the crew, and consigned all who were connected with the ship to the land where the pepper grows. Perhaps the thought of the gas, which was remorselessly burning at his expense in Saville Row, had something to do with his hot impatience. You were in a great hurry, then, said Fix to him one day, to reach Hong Kong? A very great hurry. Mr. Fogg, I suppose, is anxious to catch the steamer for Yokohama? Terribly anxious. You believe in this journey around the world, then? 
Absolutely, don't you, Mr. Fix? I? I don't believe a word of it. You're a sly dog, said Passepartout, winking at him. This expression rather disturbed Fish, uh, Fix without his knowing why. Had the Frenchman guessed his real purpose? He knew not what to think. But how could Passepartout have discovered that he was a detective? Yet in speaking as he did, the man evidently meant more than he expressed. Passepartout went still further the next day. He could not hold his tongue. Mr. Fix, he said in a bantering tone, shall we be unfortunate as to lose you when we get to Hong Kong? Why, responded Fix, a little embarrassed, I don't know, perhaps, ah, if you would only go on with us, an agent of the Peninsular Company, you know, can't stop on the way. You were only going to Bombay, and here you are in China. America's not far off, and from America to Europe is only a step. Fix looked intently at his companion, whose countenance was as serene as possible, and laughed with him. But Passepartout persisted in chaffing him by asking him if he made much of his present occupation, uh, by his present occupation. Yes and no, returned Fix. There is a good and bad luck in such things, but you must understand that I don't travel at my own expense. Oh, I'm quite sure of that, cried Passepartout, laughing heartily. Fix, fairly puzzled, descended to his cabin and gave himself up to his reflections. He was evidently suspected. Somehow or other, the Frenchman had found out that he was a detective, but had he told his master? What part was he playing in all this? Was he an accomplice or not? Was the game up then? Fix spent hours trying these things over, uh, turning these things over in his mind, sometimes thinking that all was lost, then persuading himself that Fogg was ignorant of his pres uh, presence, and then undecided what course it, would t be uh, it was best to take. Nevertheless, he preserved the coolness of mind, and at last resolved to deal plainly with Passepartout. If he did not find it practicable to rest Fogg at Hong Kong, and if Fogg made preparations to leave that last foothold of English territory, he, Fix, would tell Passepartout all. Either the servant, uh, servant was the accomplice of his master, or in this case the master knew of his operation, and he should fail, or else the servant knew nothing about the robbery, and then his interest would be to abandon the robber. Such was the situation between Fix and Passepartout. Meanwhile, Phileas Fogg moved about above them in the most majestic and unconscious indifference. He was passing methodically in his orbit around the world, regardless of the lesser stars which gravitated around him. Yet there was nearby what the astronom uh, astronomers would call a disturbing star which might have produced an agitation in this gentleman's heart. But no, the charms of Aouda failed to act, to Passepartout's great surprise, and the disturbance, if they existed, would have been more difficult to calculate than those of Uranus, which, held, uh, which led to the discovery of Neptune. It was every day an increasing wonder to Passepartout, who read in Aouda's eyes the depth of her gratitude to his master. Phileas Fogg, though brave and gallant, must be, he thought, quite heartless. As to the sentiment which was uh, this journey might have awakened in him, there was clearly no trace of such a thing, while Passepartout existed in perpetual reveries. One day he was leaning on the railing of the engine room, and was observing the engine when a sudden pitch of the steamer threw the screw out of the water. The steam came hissing out of the valves, and this made Passepartout indignant. "'Valves are not sufficiently charged!' he exclaimed. "'We are not going. "'Oh, these English! "'If this is an American craft, we should blow up, perhaps, "'but we should by at all events go faster.'" Just a reminder that I do have um, 
a poll up in the Discord on which kind of stream you would like me to do after story time in a half an hour. Uh, it's in the stream polls. Chapter 18, in which Phileas Fogg, Passepartout, and Fix eat, uh, go each about his business. The weather was bad during the later days of the voyage. The wind, obstinately remaining in the northwest, blew a gale and retarded the steamer. The Rangoon rolled heavily, and the passengers became, became impatient of the long, mo uh, monstrous waves which the wind raised before their path. A sort of tempest rose on the 3rd of November, the squall knocking the vessel about with fury and the waves running high. The Rangoon reefed all her sails, and even the rigging proved too much, whistling and shaking amid the squall. The steamer was forced to proceed slowly, and the captain estimated that she should reach Hong Kong twenty hours behind time, and more if the storm lasted. Phileas Fogg gazed at the tempestuous sea, which seemed to be struggling especially to delay him, with its habitual tranquility. He never changed countenance for an instant, though a delay of twenty hours by making him too late for the Yokohama boat would almost inevitably cause the loss of the voyager. But this man of nerve manifested neither impatience nor annoyance. It seemed as if the storm were a part of his program and had been foreseen. Aouda was amazed to find him as calm as he had been from the first time she saw him. Fix did not look at the state of things in the same light. The storm greatly pleased him. His satisfaction would have been complete with, had the Rangoon been forced to retreat before the violence of wind and waves. Each delay filled him with hope, for it became more and more probable that Fogg would be obliged to remain some days at Hong Kong, and now the heavens themselves became his allies, and the gusts and squalls. It mattered not that they made him seasick. He made no account of this inconvenience, and whilst his body was writhing under their effects, his spirit bounded with hopeful exultation. Passepartout was enraged beyond expression by the un uh, unpropitious weather. Everything had gone so well till now. Earth and sea had seemed to be at his master's service. Steamers and railways obeyed him. Wind and steam united to spend his, uh, speed his journey. Had the hour of adversity come? Passepartout was as much excited as if the twenty thousand pounds were to come from his own pocket. The storm exasperated him, the gale made him furious, and he longed to lash the obstinate sea into obedience. Poor fellow! Fix carefully concealed from his own sad, uh, from him his own satisfaction, for, had he betrayed it, Passepartout could scarcely have restrained himself from personal violence. Passepartout remained on deck as long as the tempest lasted, being unable to remain quiet below, and, talking, uh, and taking it into his head to aid the progress of the ship by leading a hand with the crew. He overwhelmed the captain, officers, and sailors, who could not help laughing at this impatience with all sorts of questions. He wanted to know exactly how long the storm was going to last, whereupon he was referred to the barometer, which seemed to have no intention of rising. Passepartout shook it with no perceptible effect, for neither shaking nor maledictions could prevail upon it to change its mind. On the fourth, however, the sea became more calm, and the storm lessened its violence. The wind veered southward and was once more favorable. Passepartout cleared up with uh, the weather. Some of the sails were, not, were unfooled, uh, unfurled, and the ragoon resumed its most rapid speed. The time lost could not, however, be regained. Land was not signaled until five o'clock on the morning of the sixth. The steamer was due on the fifth. Phileas Fogg was twenty-four hours behind, and the Yokohama steamer would, be, would of course, be missed. 
The pilot went on board at six and took his place on the bridge to guide the Rangoon through the channels to the port of Hong Kong. Passepartout longed to ask him if the steamer had left for Yokohama, but he dared not, for he wished to preserve the spark of hope which still remained till the last moment. He had confided his anxiety to Fix, who, the sly rascal, tried to console him by saying that Mr. Fogg would be in time if he took the next boat, but this only put Passepartout in a passion. Mr. Fogg, bolder than his servant, did not hesitate to approach the pilot and tranquilly asked him if he knew when a steamer would leave Hong Kong for Yokohama. At high tide tomorrow, replied the captain. Ah, said Mr. Fogg, without betraying any astonishment of embracing, ah, uh, oh, sorry, hang on, there's something in my eye. There we go. Ha! Ah, said Mr. Fogg, without betraying any astonishment. Passepartout, who heard what passed, would willingly have embraced the pilot, while Fix would have been glad to twist his neck. What is the steamer's name? asked Mr. Fogg. The Carnatic. Ought she not to have gone yesterday? Yes, sir, but they had to repair one of her boilers, and so her departure was postponed till tomorrow. Thank you, returned Mr. Fogg, descending, uh, descending mathematically to the saloon. Pasto, Passepartout clasped the pilot's hand and shook it heartily in his, delighted exclaiming, uh, in his delight, exclaiming, Pilot, you are the best of good fellows. The pilot probably does not know to this day why this res his responses won him this enthusiastic greeting. He recounted... Uh, he remounted the bridge and guided the steamer through the flotilla of junks, tankas, and fishing boats which crowd the harbor of Hong Kong. At one o'clock the Rangoon was on the quay, and the passengers were going ashore. Chance had strangely favored Phileas Fogg, for had not the Carnatic been forced to lie over for repairing her boilers, she would have left on the 6th of November, and the passengers of Japan would have been obliged to wait for a week the sailing of the next steamer. Mr. Fogg was, it is true, 24 hours behind this time, but this could not seriously imperil the remainder of his tour. The steamer which crossed the Pacific from Yokohama to San Francisco made a direct connection with that from Hong Kong, and it could not sail until the latter reached Yokohama. And if Mr. Fogg was twenty-four hours late on reaching Yokohama, this time would no doubt be easily regained in the voyage of twenty-two days across the Pacific. He found himself then about twenty-four hours behindhand, thirty-five days after leaving London. The Carnatic was announced to leave Hong Kong at five the next morning. Mr. Fogg had sixteen hours in which to attend to his business there, which was to deposit Aouda safely with her wealthy relative. On landing, he conducted her to a palanquin, in which they repaired to the club hotel. A room was engaged for the young woman, and Mr. Fogg, after seeing that she wanted for nothing, set out in search of his her cousin, Gigi. He instructed Passepartout re to remain at the hotel until his return, that Ouda might not be left entirely alone. Mr. Fogg repaired to the exchange, where he did not doubt every one would know so wealthy and considerable a personage as the Parsi merchant. Meeting a broker, he made the inquiry to learn that Gigi uh, Jiji had left China two years before, and retired from business with an immense fortune, had taken up his residence in Europe. In Holland, the broker thought, with the merchants of which country he had uh, principally traded. Phileas Fogg returned to the hotel, begged a moment's conversation with Aouda, and, without more ado, apprised her that Jiji was no longer at Hong Kong, but probably in Holland. Aouda said nothing. She passed her hand across her head, uh, her forehead and reflected a few moments. Then, in her sweet, soft voice, she said, What ought I to do, Mr. Fogg? 
It is simple, responded the gentleman. Go on to Europe. But I cannot intrude. You do not intrude, nor do you in the least embarrass my project. Passepartout, monsieur, go to the Carnatic and engage three cabins. Passepartout delighted that the young woman, who was very gracious to him, was going to continue the journey with them, went off at a brisk gait to obey his master's orders. Chapter 19, in which Passepartout takes a too great interest in his master and what comes of it. Hong Kong is an island which came into the possession of the English by the Treaty of Nankin after the War of 1842, and the colonizing genius of the English has created upon it an important city and an excellent port. The island is situated at the mouth of the Canton River, and is separated by about 60 miles from the Portuguese town of Macau, on the, the opposite coast. Hong Kong has been beaten, uh, has beaten Macau in the struggle for the Chinese trade, and now the greater part of the transportation of Chinese goods finds its depot at the former place. Docks, uh, sorry, it was depot, but there was a little um, hat over the O, kind of threw me off guard. Docks, hospitals, wharves, a Gothic cathedral, a government house, a macad. Uh, macadamized streets giving to Hong Kong the appearance of a town in Kent or Surrey transferred by some strange magic to the Antipodes. Passepartout wandered with his hands in his pockets toward the Victorian port, gazing as he went at the curious palanquins and other modes of conveyance, and the groups of Chinese, Japanese, and Europeans who passed to and fro in the street. Hong Kong seemed to him not unlike Bombay, Calcutta, and Singapore, since, like them, it betrayed everywhere the evidence of English supremacy. At the Victoria port he found a confused mass of ships of all nations, English, French, American, and Dutch, men-of-war and trading vessels, Japanese and Chinese junks, sempas, tankas, and flower boats, which formed so many floating parterres. Passepartout noticed in the crowd a number of the natives, who seemed very old and well-dressed in yellow. On going into a barber's to get shaved, he learned that these ancient men were all at least eighty years old, at which age they were permitted to wear yellow, which is the imperial color. Passepartout, without exactly knowing why, thought this very funny. On reaching the quay, where they went to embark on the Carnatic, he was not astonished to find Fix walking up and down. The detective seemed very disturbed and disappointed. This is bad, muttered Passepartout for the gentlemen of the Reform Club. He accosted Fix with a merry smile as if he had not uh, perceived that gentleman's chagrin. The detective had, indeed, good reason to inveigh against the bad luck which pursued him. The warrant had not come was certainly on the way, but as certainly it could not now reach Hong Kong for several days, and this being the last English territory on Mr. Fogg's route, the robber would escape unless he could manage to detain him. Well, Monsieur Fix, said Passepartout, have you decided to go on with us as far as America? Yes, returned Fix through his set teeth. Good, exclaimed Passepartout, laughing heartily. I knew you could not persuade yourself to separate from us. Come and engage your berth. They entered the steamer office and secure cabins for four persons. The clerk, as he gave them the tickets, informed them that, the repairs of the Carnatic having been completed, the steamer would leave that very evening and not next morning, as had been announced. That will suit my master all the better, said Passepartout. I will go and let him know. Fix now decided to make a bold move. He resolved to tell Passepartout all. It seemed to be the only possible means of keeping Phileas Fogg several days longer at Hong Kong. He accordingly invited his companion into a tavern which caught his eye on the quay. On entering, they found themselves in a large room handsomely decorated, at the end of which was a large camp bed furnished with cushions. 
Several persons lie upon this bed in a deep silence. At the small tables which were arranged about the room, some thirty customers were drinking English beer, porter, gin, and brandy, smoking the wild, uh, sm smoking the wild long red clay pipes stuffed with little balls of opium mingled with essence of rose. From time to time, one of the smokers, overcome with a narcotic, would slip under the table, whereupon the waiters, taking him by the head and feet, carried and laid him onto the bed. The bed already supported twenty of these stupefied sots. Fix and Passepartout saw that they were in a smoking house haunted by those wretched, cadaverous, idiotic creatures to whom the English merchants sell every year the miserable drug called opium to the amount of one million four hundred thousand pounds, thousands devoted to one of the most despicable vices which afflict humanity. The Chinese government has in vain attempted to deal with the evil by stringent laws. It passed gradually from the rich, to whom it was at first exclusively reserved, to the lower classes, and then its ravages could not be ar arrested. Opium is smoked everywhere, at all times, by men and women in the celestial empire, and, once ac uh, accustomed to it, the victims cannot dispense with it, except by suffering horrible bodily contortions and agonies. A great smoker can smoke as many as eight pipes a day, but he dies in five years. It was in one of these dens that Fix and Passepartout, in search of a friendly glass, found themselves. Passepartout had no money, but willingly accepted Fix's invitation in the hope of returning the obligation at some future time. They ordered two bottles of porter, uh, to which the Frenchman did ample justice, while Fix observed him with close attention. They chatted about the journey, and Passepartout was especially merry at the idea that Fix was going to continue it with them. When the bottles were empty, however, he rose to go and tell his master of the change in the time of the sailing of the Carnatic. Fix caught him by the arm and said, Wait a moment. What for, Mr. Fix? I want to have a serious talk with you. A serious talk? cried Passepartout, drinking up the little wine that was left in the bottom of the glass. "'Well, we'll talk about it tomorrow. I haven't time now. Stay. What I have to say concerns your master.' Passepartout, at this, looked attentively at his companion. Fix's face seemed to have a singular expression. He resumed his seat. "'What is it that you have to say?' Fix placed his hand upon Passepartout's arm, and, lowering his voice, said, "'You have guessed who I am?' "'Parbleu,' said Passepartout, smiling." And I'm going to tell you everything, now that I know everything, my friend. Ah, it's very good, but go on, go on. First, though, let me tell you that those gentlemen have put themselves in a useless expense. Useless, said Fix. You speak confidently. It's clear that you don't know how large the sum is. Of course I do, returned Passepartout. Twenty thousand pounds. Fifty-five thousand, answered Fix, pressing his con... Uh, companion's hand. What? cried the Frenchman. Has Monsieur Fogg dared uh, fifty-five thousand pounds? There's all the more reason for not losing an instant, he continued, getting up hastily. Fix pushed Passepartout back in his chair and resumed. Fifty-five thousand pounds, and if I succeed, I get two thousand pounds. If you'll help me, I'll let you have five hundred of them. Help you? cried Passepartout, whose eyes were standing wide open. Yes, help me keep Mr. Fogg here for two or three days. Why, what are you saying? Those gentlemen are not satisfied following my master and suspecting his honor, but they must try to put obstacles in his way. I blush for them. What do you mean? I mean that it is a, pr a piece of shameful trickery. They might as well lay lay Mr. Fogg and put his money in their pockets. "'That's just what we count on doing.' "'It's a conspiracy, then,' cr cried Passepartout, "'who became more and more excited "'as the liquor mounted in his head, "'for he drank without perceiving it. "'A real conspiracy, and gentlemen, too. "'Bah!' "'Fix began to be puzzled. "'Members of the Reform Club,' continued Passepartout, 
You must know, Monsieur Fix, that my master is an honest man, and that when he makes a wager, he tries to win it fairly. But who do you think I am? asked Fix, looking at him patiently. Pablo, an agent of the members of the Reform Club, sent out here to interrupt my master's journey. But though I found you out some time ago, I have taken good care to say nothing about it to Mr. Fogg. He knows nothing, then? Nothing, replied Passepartout, again emptying his glass. The detective passed his hand across his forehead, hesitating before he spoke again. What should he do? Passepartout's mistake seemed sincere, but it made his design more difficult. It was evident that the servant was not the master's accomplice, as Fix had been inclined to suspect. Well, said the detective to himself, as he is not an accomplice, he will help me. He had no time to lose. Fogg must be detained at Hong Kong, so he resolved to make a clear breast of it. Listen to me, said Fix abruptly. I am not, as you think, an agent of the members of the Reform Club. Bah, reported Passepartout with an air of raillery. I am a police detective sent out here by the London office. You a detective? I will prove it. Here is my commission. Passepartout was speechless with astonishment when Fix displayed his document, the genuineness of which could not be doubted. Mr. Fogg's wager, resumed Fix, is only a pretext of which you and the gentlemen of the reform are dupes. He had a motive for securing your in innocent complicity. But why? Listen, on the 28th of last September, a robbery of £55,000 was committed at the Bank of England by a person whose description was fortunately secured. Here is this description. It answers exactly to that of Mr. Phileas Fogg. What nonsense! cried Passepartout, striking the table with his fist. My master is the most honorable of men. How can you tell? You know scarcely anything about him. He went into his service the day he came away, and he came away on a foolish pretext, without trunks and carrying a large amount in banknotes. And yet you are bold enough to assert that he is an honest man. Yes, yes, repeated the poor fellow me mechanically. Would you like to be arrested as his accomplice? Passepartout, overcome by what he had heard, held his head between his hands, and did not dare to look at the detec detective. Phileas Fogg, the savior of Aouda, that brave and generous man, a robber, and yet how many presumptions there were against him. Passepartout essayed to uh, reject the suspicions which forced themselves upon his mind. He did not wish to believe that his master was guilty. "'Well, what do you want of me?' he said at last, with effort. "'See here,' replied Fix. "'I have tracked Mr. Fogg to this place, "'but as yet I have failed to receive the warrant of arrest "'for which I sent to London. "'You must help me to keep him here in Hong Kong. "'I, but I, I will share with you "'the two thousand pounds reward offered by the Bank of England.' "'Never!' replied Passepartout, "'who tried to rise but fell back, "'exhausted in mind and body.' Mr. Fix, he stammered, even though what you say be true, if my master is really the robber you are seeking for, which I deny, I have been, am, in his service. I have seen his generosity and goodness, and I will never betray him, not for all the gold in the world. I came from a village where they don't eat that kind of bread. You refuse? I refuse. Consider what I've said nothing, uh, that I've said nothing, said Fix, and let us drink. Yes, let us drink. Passepartout felt himself yielding more and more to the effects of the liquor. Fix, seeing that he must, at all hazards, be separated from his master, wished to re entirely overcome him. Some pipes full of opium lay upon the table. Oh, goodness, well, I might slip over this part. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so Passepartout falls asleep and just leaves Passepartout there. So yes, I have slipped over that part because I don't like the idea of reading 
um, the drug use going on. So there you go. Uh, we could probably do one more chapter, I think. Yeah, one more chapter. Chapter 20, in which Fix comes face to face with Phileas Fogg. While these events were passing at the opium house, Mr. Fogg, unconscious of the danger he was in at losing the steamer, was quietly escorting Aouda about the streets of the English Quarter, making the necessary purchases for the long voyage before them. It was all very well for an Englishman like Mr. Fogg to make the tour of the world with a carpet bag. A lady could not be expected to travel comfortably under such conditions. He acquitted his task with characteristic serenity, and invariably replied to the remonstrances of his fair companion, who was confused by his patience and generosity. It is an interest of my journey, a part of my program. The purchases made, they returned to the hotel, where they dined at a, sup a sumptuously served table d'hôtel, after which Aouda, shaking hands with her protector, after the English fashion, retired to her room for rest. Mr. Fogg absorbed himself throughout the evening in the perusal of the Times and illustrated London news. Had he been capable of being astonished at anything, it would have been not to see his servant return at bedtime. But, knowing that the steamer was not to leave for Yokohama until the next morning, he did not disturb himself about the matter. When Passepartout did not appear the next morning to answer his master's bell, Mr. Fogg, not betraying the least vexation, contented himself with taking his carpet bag, calling Aouda, and sending for a palanquin. It was then eight o'clock. At half past nine, it being then high tide, the Carnatic would leave the harbor. Mr. Fogg and Aouda got into the palanquin, their luggage being brought after on a wheelbarrow, and half an hour later stepped upon the quay whence they were to embark. Mr. Fogg then learned that the Carnatic had sailed the evening before. He had expected to find not only the steamer but his domestic, and was forced to give up both. But no sign of disappointment appeared on his face, and he merely remarked to Aouda, it is an accident, madam, nothing more. At this moment, a man who had been observing him attentively approached. It was Fix, who, bowing, addressed Mr. Fogg. Were you not like me, sir, a passenger by the Rangoon, which arrived yesterday? I was, sir, replied Mr. Fogg coldly, but I have not the honor, pardon me, I thought I should find your servant here. Do you know where he is? asked Aouda anxiously. What? "'responded Fix, feigning surprise. "'Is he not with you?' "'No,' said Aouda. Aouda. "'He has not made his appearance since yesterday. "'Could he have gone on board the Carnatic with us? Uh, without us?' "'Without you, madam,' answered the detective. "'Excuse me, did you intend to sail in the Carnatic?' "'Yes, sir.' "'So did I, madam, and I ex am excessively disappointed. "'The Carnatic, its repairs being completed, "'left Hong Kong twelve hours before the stated time "'without any notice being given, "'and we must now wait a week for another steamer.' "'As he said a week, Fix felt his heart leap for joy. "'Fog detained at Hong Kong a week. "'There would be time for the warrant to arrive, "'and fortune at last favoured the representative of the law.' His horror may be imagined when he heard Mr. Fogg say in his placid voice, But there are other vessels beside the Carnatic, it seems to me, in the harbor of Hong Kong. And, offering his arm to Aouda, he directed his steps toward the docks in search of some craft about to start. Fix, stupefied, followed. It seemed as if he were attached to Mr. Fogg by an invisible thread. Chance, however, appeared really to have abandoned the man it had hitherto served so well. For three hours Phileas Fogg wandered about the docks with the determination, if necessary, to charter a vessel to carry him to Yokohama, but he could only find vessels which were loaded or unloaded, uh, loading or unloading, and which could not, therefore, set sail. Fix began to hope again. But Mr. Fogg, far from being discouraged, was continuing his search, resolved not to stop if he had to resort to Macau when he was accosted by a sailor on one of the wharves. Is your honor looking for a boat? Have you a boat ready to sail? Yes, your honor, a pilot boat. 
Number 43, the best in the harbor. Does she go fast? Between eight and nine knots the hour. Will you look at her? Yes. Your honor will be satisfied with her. Is it for the sea excursion? No, for a voyage. A voyage? Yes. Will you agree to take me to Yokohama? The sailor leaned on the railing, opening his eyes wide, and said, Is your honor joking? No, I have missed the Carnatic, and I must get to Yokohama by the 14th at the latest to take the boat for San Francisco. I'm sorry, said the sailor, but it is impossible. I offer you a hundred pounds per day and an additional reward of two hundred pounds if I reach Yokohama in time. Are you in earnest? Very much so. The pilot walked away a little distance and gazed out to sea, evidently struggling between the anxiety to gain a large sum and the fear of venturing so far. Fix was in mortal suspense. Mr. Fogg turned to Oda and asked her, "'You would not be afraid, would you, madam?' "'Not with you, Mr. Fogg,' was her answer. The pilot now returned, shuffling his feet in his hand, a uh, hat in his hands. "'Well, pilot?' I said Mr. Fogg. Well, your honor, replied he, I could not risk myself, my men, or my little boat of scarcely twenty tons on so long a voyage as this time, at this time of year. Besides, we could not reach Yokohama in time, for it is sixteen hundred and sixty miles from Hong Kong. Only sixteen hundred? said Mr. Fogg. It's the same thing. Fix breathed more freely. But, added the pilot, it might be arranged another way. Fix ceased to breathe at all. How? asked Mr. Fogg. By going to Nagasaki, at the extreme south of Japan, or even to Shanghai, which is only 800 miles from here. I mean, uh, in going to Shanghai, we should not be forced to sail wide of the Chinese coast, which would be of a great advantage as the currents run northward and would aid us. Pilot? said Mr. Fogg. I must take the American steamer at Yokohama, not at Shanghai or Nagasaki. Why not? returned the pilot. The San Francisco steamer does not start from Yokohama. It puts in at Yokohama and Nagasaki, but it starts from Shanghai. You are sure of that? Perfectly. And when does the boat leave Shanghai? On the 11th at 7 in the evening, we have, therefore, four days before us. That is, 96 hours, and in that time, if we had good luck in a southwest wind and the sea was calm, we could make those 800 miles to Shanghai. And you go in an hour, as soon as provisions could be got aboard and the sails put, uh, put up. It is a bargain. You the master of the boat... Yes, John Bunsby, master of the Tancadere. Would you like some earnest money? If it would not put your honor out, here are two hundred pounds on account, sir, added Phileas Fogg, turning to fix, if you would like to take advantage. Thanks, sir. I was about to ask for the favor. Very well. In half an hour we shall go on board. But poor Passepartout, urged Arda, who was much disturbed by the servant's disappearance. I should do all I can to find him, replied, Paspa, uh, <laughs> replied Phileas Fogg. While Fix, in a feverish, nervous state, repaired to the pilot boat, the others directed their course to the police station at Hong Kong. Phileas Fogg there, bra uh, there gave Passepartout's description and left a sum of money to be spent in the search of him. The same formalities having been gone through at the French consulate, and the palanquin having stopped at the hotel for the luggage, which had been sent back there, they returned to the wharf. It was now three o'clock, and pilot boat number 43, with its crew on board and its provisions stored away, was, rapid, uh, was ready for departure. The Tancadere was a neat little craft of twenty tons, as gracefully built as if she were a racing yacht. Her shining copper sheathing, her galvanized iron work, her deck, white as ivory, betrayed the pride taken by John Bunsby in making her presentable. Her two masts leaned a trifle backwards. She carried a brigantine <clears throat> for a sail, storm jib, and standing jib, and was all ri uh, well rigged for running 
before the wind, and she seemed capable of brisk speed, which, indeed, she had already proved by gaining several prizes in pilot boat races. The, cruise of the, was composed, uh, the crew of the Tankadere was composed of John Bunsby, the master and four hardy mariners, who were familiar with the Chinese seas. John Bunsby himself, a man of forty-five of their uh, or thereabouts, vigorous, sunburnt, with a slightly uh, sprightly expression of the eye, an energetic and self-reliant countenance, would have inspired confidence in the most timid. Phileas Fogg and Aouda went on board, where they found Fix already installed. Below deck was a spare cabin, a square cabin, of which the walls bulged out in the form of cots. Above a circular divan, in the centre was a table provided with a swinging lamp. The accommodation was confined but neat. "'I am sorry to have nothing better to offer you,' said Mr. Fogg to Fix, who bowed with resp uh, without responding. The detective had a feeling akin to humiliation in profiting by the kindness of Mr. Fogg. "'It's certain,' thought he, "'the rascal as he is, he is a polite one.' The sails and the English flag were hoisted at ten minutes past three. Mr. Fogg and Aouda, who were seated on deck, cast a last glance at the quay, in the hope of espying Passepartout. Fix was not without his fears, lest chance should direct the steps of the unfortunate servant, who he had so badly treated, in this direction, in which case an explanation the reverse of satisfactory to the detective must have ensued. But the Frenchman did not appear, and, without doubt, was still lying under the stupefying uh, influence. John Bunsby, master at length, uh, master, at length gave the order to start, and the Tankadere, taking the wind under her brigantine, fore sail, and standing jib, bounded briskly forward over the waves. All right, so we have come to the end of our story time, and the results of my little um, poll are in. So I'm going to do a gaming stream uh, after a short break, and um, I'm thinking of doing some Terraria. So I'm going to end the stream here. I'll let you know when I'm back so you can refresh the page. I hope you'll stick around, and if not, thanks for hanging out and listening, and I'll see you next time. Bye.